United States Army presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Recently at Fort Benning, Georgia, the Army presented a dramatic showing of its latest and best in weapons and equipment. Today's big picture will show you what leaders of industry, government, and the military saw during this three-day demonstration called Project Man. The code name, MAN, has a double significance. The initials M-A-N stand for Modern Army Needs. The type of weapons and equipment your Army is developing and must have to be prepared for combat and to preserve the peace. But those initials also spell out MAN and the quality of any Army, however well equipped, depends ultimately on the quality of the individual men who fill its ranks. In the next few minutes, you will see in action many of the latest Army weapons, vehicles, and techniques. A dramatic showcase of today's Army capabilities and tomorrow's possibilities. Project Man. <laughs> On opening day, top leaders of the military establishment arrived by air. Among them, General Lyman L. Lemnitzer, Army Chief of Staff, and General Omar Bradley. A busy three days awaits the visiting dignitaries as the tight schedule of Project Man gets underway. Early on the agenda is a dramatic demonstration of firepower and airmobile assault. On hand is the chief executive, who receives a warm ovation, along with Secretary of the Army, Wilbur M. Brucker, and Defense Secretary, Thomas Gates. The stands are filled to capacity with military observers, newsmen, and civilian guests. An impressive array of the Army's most modern firepower stands ready for the signal to go into action. Later, you will see many of these weapons at closer range. But for now, let's watch them in action. on the heels of the firepower demonstration is a full-scale airmobile assault maneuver which begins with the arrival of light copters which spearhead the attack. Presenting a moving target, the little choppers alternately rise up and duck down as they deliver fire on simulated enemy positions. Many are equipped with machine guns, some with rockets. The second phase of the airmobile attack is opened as larger assault copters move up to add their heavier rocket firepower. Now come the transport copters loaded with assault troops. Troops which arrive at the battle area fresh and ready thanks to the helicopters. Light ground transport is also brought up by copter lift. The Army's massive H-37 copter unloads additional firepower support in the form of Jeep-mounted 106mm recoilless rifles. The attack moves swiftly. 
the assault force pressing the advantage of its sudden arrival. Armored support moves up to reinforce the advance. The new Iroquois turbine-powered copter handles the job of evacuating simulated casualties. Meanwhile, such air-transportable and hard-hitting weapons as the 106 recoilless rifle make the infantry's job easier. The same is true of the Army's new guided anti-tank missile, the SS-10. Small, highly mobile, and rugged, it is sudden death to enemy armor. SS-10 is also demonstrated in action from a low-flying copter. Now, for the first time, a whirlybird in flight is capable of destroying a tank. Mobile assault maneuver draws to a successful close, but the action is far from over. With darkness comes a night assault demonstration, very aptly called the Mad Minute. Equally impressive demonstration, and easier on the eardrums, comes with the presentation of the Army's latest and best combat equipment. The Army's missile arsenal comes in for much of the attention here. This is the Corporal medium-range ballistic missile. The now familiar Nike Hercules, which guards the sky above many of our cities. And the high firepower Hawk, ground-to-air missile on its triple launcher. The pinpoint accurate Pershing missile gets a thorough examination along with its TEL, Transporter Erector Launcher. Now in the research and development stage, the Pershing is slated to replace the Redstone as a general support missile for the field army. Both ground and air transportable, it can operate on the principle which missile men call S and S, shoot and scoot. Traditional weapons like the familiar howitzer take on a new importance since they can now deliver a nuclear warhead. The Little John provides a highly mobile field weapon while its big brother, the Honest John, continues for the present as a reliable ground-to-ground -ground ballistic weapon of nuclear capability. Something new is the tiny red-eye ground-to-air missile, which can make the individual foot soldier a walking anti-aircraft missile base. The Army's main battle tank of the present, the M48 Patton, is joined by the tank of the future, the M60, which uses aluminum to cut its weight by three and a half tons. The task of clearing roads of enemy mines will move much faster with a high-capacity jeep-mounted mine detector unit. Another armored asset is this adaptation of the World War II hedgerow buster. And a self-propelled scissors bridge will enable our biggest tanks to cross gullies and defiles without delay. Highly experimental but working perfectly is this remote-controlled bulldozer which goes eerily about its work with no human operator on board.
The familiar Jeep has a couple of big brothers as the Army's truck family continues to grow and improve. Not glamorous, perhaps, but vitally important to the modern Army are its trucks. Here, the standard 6x6 delivers the smallest transport vehicle, the mechanical mule. The mule weighs only 900 pounds, but can carry 1,000 pounds of cargo over terrain that would stop another vehicle in its tracks. With four-wheel drive, this little dynamo can wade creeks, negotiate forest tracks, in fact, go just about anywhere the foot soldier goes. Its unusual four-wheel steering feature gives it a very short turning radius. And if the driver needs to keep his head down, the hinge steering gear swings over and the mule provides cover as the driver continues the advance. Like the many other truck types used by the Army, the mule is designed to do a specific job and do it well. Now for a look at the amazing overland train. Up front is the control cab. Just behind that, air-conditioned living quarters for the crew. Each of the trailers will carry 150 tons. A train of 10 trailers will carry an even 3 million pounds. The mammoth transporter is equally at home over field terrain or ice cap, desert sands or Arctic snows. Each of the 10-foot wheels is driven by its own electric motor and the possibility of converting to atomic power is now being explored. At still another demonstration area, a showing of the Army's potential in the air gets underway. Graphically illustrating its fantastic lift, an H-37 helicopter hovers in to deliver two jeeps and jeep trailers, all in a single cargo sling. The new Vertol copter demonstrates its quick loading ramp by unloading a mule-mounted recoilless rifle ready for action. The de Havilland YAC-1 Caribou gives a remarkable demonstration of short field landing on an open field, dead stop within 175 yards. And even with a full load, the Caribou can lift off with a run of just over 180 yards. The final phase of the Army air demonstration involves a showing of specialized airdrop capabilities. Troops are dropped from copters, from light transport aircraft, and finally a large-scale drop from the versatile and rugged caribou. Without duplicating facilities of the Air Force, the Army maintains that a flexible air transport capability within its own ranks is a tactical necessity in fast-moving local operations. Now the spectators, having seen these new devices in action from a distance, move out to get a closer look. At the display area, visitors find the Nike Zeus and Booster, the Sergeant, the Corporal, the new Davy Crockett nuclear weapon, the de Havilland Caribou.
The much talked about air car is a popular item and one which you will see in operation a little later. The Army's new M14 rifle, replacement for the M1, captures the interest of General William C. Westmoreland, superintendent of the military academy. The M14 can be fired semi-automatically like its predecessor, the M1. Or it can be converted by the flip of a lever to a fully automatic weapon. Among the items on display at the Signal Corps area, the various types of radio-controlled drone aircraft come into the spotlight. In addition to the standard prop-driven model, there is the new SD-5 jet drone capable of flying extended high-altitude reconnaissance missions. For a demonstration of radio-controlled reconnaissance, an SD-1 surveillance drone is cranked up for the takeoff. Once the engine is running, the remote controller is in charge. Presenting a very small, fast-moving target to enemy gunners, the surveillance drone can zoom over enemy-held territory, taking detailed motion pictures as directed by radio from home base. Within minutes, it can return to friendly territory for recovery by the radio-released parachute built into the fuselage. High-speed pickup and processing of the film exposed on reconnaissance flights makes it possible for a field commander to get photos of enemy positions within a matter of minutes after the drone is launched. Still another demonstration area draws a large crowd eager to get a look at the Army's latest water crossing techniques. Screening for water assault is provided by a fast-moving smoke generator boat. Under cover of the smoke, low silhouette amphibians slip across the water and onto the beach. Early in the proceedings, an H-34 copter drops parts for a footbridge on the opposite shore. Before the demonstration ends, the bridge will be completed. Meantime, assault teams demonstrate the various types of assault craft available to field troops for inland water crossings. They vary from inflatable rubber boats, which carry a dozen men, to light plastic shells capable of transporting a squad, to small four- or five-man boats. All these assault craft have one thing in common. They are light and easy to handle. In minutes, the building of the floating footbridge is well underway. The sections fastened together without complex tools and assembly is rapid. A group of the Army's armored amphibious personnel carriers demonstrate their ability to give both protection and transportation to the foot soldier making an inland water crossing. Something really new in amphibians is the Lark 5, which uses aluminum to cut its weight and add to its maneuverability, speed, and safety of float. A larger version, the twin-engine Lark 15, is also demonstrated. Like the Lark 5, it can make 10 miles per hour in the water and upwards of 30 miles per hour on land. Unlike the smaller version, it has a full-width unloading ramp in front so that vehicles like this M56 90 millimeter self-propelled anti-tank gun can roll directly into action. A more familiar amphibious vehicle is the Duck, but not so well known as the new rolling liquid transporter which is towed behind. Each unit can carry a thousand gallons of fuel, 500 gallons in each of the oversized wheels. With fuel line connections in place, a vehicle towing one of these units can increase its range by hundreds of miles. In 
Improved ferrying techniques are shown as heavy vehicles are moved quickly across the water. And each ferry is also a section of heavy-duty bridge and can be used as such when it has unloaded its cargo on the shore. The floating footbridge is nearing completion as the river crossing demonstration goes into its final phases. Copter delivery techniques are many and varied. What's the easiest way to deliver a ponton to shore? Set it on the water and blow it in. Simple, practical. Also proving its practicality is the single file footbridge now being completed. And even as the final anchor stakes are being driven in, the men begin moving across it. With the completion of the footbridge construction, the spotlight turns to an item which everyone has been waiting to see. The much talked about air car is to be put through its paces over water. Riding on a cushion of air and guided by jets of air which are channeled through vents at the sides, the air car skims a few inches above any level surface. Here it is water, but it could as well be snow, ice, or open ground. The air car is highly experimental as far as the Army is concerned, but it may well offer some interesting possibilities for future military use. One of the most popular demonstrations of the entire three days comes when instructors from Fort Benning's famed Ranger course show some of the abilities required of these crack fighting troops. Ranger training emphasizes individual combat techniques, and these instructors are experts. The demonstration is realistic, sometimes almost too realistic. Ranger training may require its men to negotiate any type of terrain, day or night, with or without rest, food, water. To do this, the ranger must have a good working command of practical rope techniques. Not all Ranger students become expert enough for this, but for the men who teach them, it's all in a day's work. The student Ranger has to develop perfect confidence in his ability to tackle any obstacle that gets in his way. He gets that confidence by negotiating such courses as this, often at the end of a three-day combat problem during which he has slept little, if at all. Sounds impossible, perhaps, but hundreds of student rangers do it every year. The end product of this hard, demanding training is a superbly trained fighting man with a new respect for his capacity for endurance and the ability to carry this training back to his unit when he graduates from the Ranger course.
The ultimate object? To provide a nucleus of these men in every combat unit of the modern American Army to make still better the quality of the best. Eubanks Field, a fitting climax to Project Man gets underway as Army Secretary Brucker arrives to play the central role in an especially appropriate unveiling and dedication ceremony. We've come together to dedicate and unveil a statue to the greatest military asset the United States has, the individual combat soldier. Nothing can excel the spirit of dedication and devotion that this man himself personifies. It's the individual soldier that we've come to honor and to respect. And now, on behalf of the United States Army, wherever brave men fight and die for freedom, you will find me. I am always ready, now and forever. I'm the infantry, the queen of battles. Follow me. That plaque will be an inspiration and a beckoning in the generations to come to a young man willing to breast whatever may come for their great country. A modern army needs new weapons, devices, vehicles. The United States Army needs them. But what we heard at the beginning is still true. The quality of any army, however well equipped, depends on the quality of the individual men who fill its ranks. The Big Picture is an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.